This video was made possible thanks to the support of our amazing patrons. We couldn't do this without you. Don't forget that you can support the channel for free and receive 10% off orders over $10 of Flipside Gaming by using the promo code AFFINITY at the checkout. Or if TCG Player and Magic Madhouse are more your thing, then be sure to place your order through our affiliate links in the description. Once again, at no extra cost to yourselves. Hello everyone and welcome back to another Law of the Land video brought to you by Affinity for Commander. My name is Alex, and today we're diving into the lore of one of the biggest bads ever to bad in magic, the Phyrexians. In this, the first part of our two-part series, we're going to be looking at where the Phyrexians came from, their home plane, and who Yorgmoth really was. So, without the way, let's get into it. <laughs> Now, in the beginning of its life, Phyrexia was just an unnamed plane in the vast span of the multiverse, but it already consisted of several spheres. Spheres in Magic's planes are kind of like different places within it. So rather than existing as a two-dimensional space like this, they exist more spherically like this. The spheres of this unnamed plane were of metallic planes, harsh forests, with even some life growing there. Not dissimilar to that of Mirrodin, but we're not going to be jumping down that particularly oily rabbit hole just yet. Ah yes, this was indeed a rather nice and quaint little plain, full of peaceful life, until the Fire Nation attacked. Nope, wait, sorry, that's the, that's the wrong law. Ah, here we are. Until Yorgmoth arrived. You see, Yorgmoth was a simple physician within the Thran Empire, an ancient power within Dominaria, his home plane. And one day, whilst out picking daisies for the children of the hospice, Yorgmoth ran across Diafed, a planeswalker. And Yorgmoth convinced Diafed to show him a different plane of existence, where he'd be free to continue his, um, research. Which Diafed, for some reason, decided to agree and showed him the aforementioned uninhabited plain, yet to be named. And then, after a small misunderstanding with the Thran Council involving a vote, an overthrowing, an imprisonment, and not a small amount of violence, Yorgmoth was exiled from the Thran Empire. And it was during this time that Yorgmoth decided to really start to put in the work to his little planar project. But Yorgmoth did not go alone. So, being the kindly physician he is, he brought along several of his recent patients with him to his new home. He was able to accomplish this through a portal that Diafed had happily, and more than willingly, made between Dominaria and Yorgmos new, um, hospital? Lab? Home? Experimental plane of torches, there we go, that'll do. After all, Yorgmoth at this point in the story hadn't really done anything that bad. Mm, apart from... He did set the black cough on the dwarves, causing the end to a thousand years of dwarven rule leading to a workers' rebellion. Turned the creeping mold of Argoth into a virulent plague, decimating the elves. Kidnapping twelve elvish priests and demanding ransom for them, and then once the ransom was paid, delivered the twelve bodies of the elves along with sugar water. Lovely. Set the white death upon the minotaurs just to see what it would do. Infected the cat people with rabies. Poisoned the human tribes of Galatomisha. And then pithed and vivisected the bay of Shivan Vyashinu. Yeah. If you couldn't go see a doctor, I'd recommend a different physician. Ideally one played by David Tennant. But the patients that Yorgmoth brought with him were suffering from a disease called Phythesis, a disease both terrible and difficult to say. The disease caused a wasting away of the person's bone and muscle, which was caused by overexposure to power stone radiation. Yorgmoth deduced the best means of combating this disease was to replace the weakened flesh with bits of artifice and metal because 
Of course you would. He called this process phyresis. And it was through this process that Jung was able to help a lot of the people that came to his plane. Help in massive quotation marks, if you get my meaning. And it was from this process that he also found the name of his new plane, Phyrexia. Which is either a touching homage to the process that saved many people's lives, or a deeply disturbing means of reminding them of the process which transformed them from humans into this. Let you decide. But now Jorgmoth had his home away from home to continue his experiments, twisting the bodies of his patients into longer and stronger forms. And within his newly crowned plane, Jorgmoth was able to bind his very soul to the plane's core, essentially toggling god mode whilst he was on Phyrexia, essentially making him the pure, undisputed god of that plane. However, he still had enemies looking to close the portal between Dominaria and Phyrexia, and, if time the day allowed, kill him. Several different factions within Dominaria began battling against Yorgmoth, but now he had his own forces more than equipped to combat those of the Dominarians, and with the new Phyrexians, Yorgmoth was able to bat away any manner of ensuing forces. Even his one-time ally, Diafed, had discovered that Yorgmoth was in fact not a very nice chap and decided it was time to close the portal. Yorgmoth, being a perfectly reasonable chap, did not like the idea of this, so decided the best course of action was to ask her nicely to not do that. Oh, no, wait, lost some page again. No, actually, he stabbed her in the back of the head with a dagger to prevent her from planes walking away and essentially turning her into a vegetable. Yeah, I'm going to be honest, I'd even take someone played by Christopher Eccleston at this point. It was in fact only thanks to the betrayal of his most trusted ally, Rebecca, that Yorgmoth was actually finally stopped. During a skirmish in the city of Halcyon, yes, like Halcyon days, the, the names of these places are not subtle. But during the skirmish in Not Subtle City, Yorgmoth's forces were forced to retreat when stone charges that were attacking the city released off a toxic gas that threatened to wipe out both forces. Yorgmoth's efforts to control the gas failed, and he was forced to retreat with his army back through the portal into Phyrexia. Finally seeing the light, Rebecca pulled the dagger from Diafed, allowing her finally to die, and then closing the portal using the power stones that had kept it open, which, coincidentally, were inside the skull of her husband. Oh, sorry, did I forget to mention? Yeah, Yorgmoth placed the power stones opening the portal inside the skull of Rebecca's husband. Because, you know, that's something you do. But now Yorgmoth, his Phyrexians, and his followers of Halcyon are now all trapped in Phyrexia, unable to return to Dominaria, locked away from harming anyone for good. But since this video is by no means over, you can tell how long that lasted. I'll give you a hint, it went about as well as Tybalt fighting Sorin. During his now permanent isolation from Dominaria, Yorgmoth set about cultivating his forces, and whilst he couldn't bang around his old home anymore, he could certainly go and mess around with the rest of the multiverse. But despite not being a planeswalker, this did not trouble Yorgmoth. He was still able to transverse, or rather his forces were, across the multiverse using portal ships, Phyrexian technology of large ships able to bend through space and push into other planes of existence. As the Phyrexian scourge spread across the multiverse, they came across more and more life forms to corrupt and turn into their own number increasing the vast armies of Phyrexia as they spread across many more planes of existence, tormenting anyone that got in their way. It was during this time that two little rascals back on Dominaria were messing around in a cave and happened to stumble across a certain portal. Through some very neglectful actions, these two little boys were able to reactivate the portal, once again opening a path between Dominaria and Phyrexia. Yorgmoth, being the psychopath that he is, was overjoyed at the prospect of being able to ruin his old home world, 
So, sent several sleeper agents, as well as a member of his own inner circle, Geth, into Dominaria to try and disrupt the plane as much as possible, preparing it for his incoming invasion. The idea of messing up Dominaria was greatly helped by our aforementioned two little rascals, whom, if you haven't guessed who they are, welcome to your first Magic the Gathering lore video. And to everyone else, they are of course, Urza and Mishra. Through the Brothers' War, however, the Phyrexians were able to get to and corrupt Mishra heavily, turning him into more machine than man and corroding his mind, descending him further and further into insanity. Yes, all seemed to be going rather well for the Phyrexians. The portal to Dominaria was back open, the plane was tearing itself apart with a war that they had a hand in causing, and their forces were happily amassing, ready for a big invasion. This, however, all came to a screeching halt when Urza flipped the table, calling bollocks to variants, and decided to nuke the entire plane of Dominaria, killing everyone, turning himself into a planeswalker, and single-handedly winning the war by virtue of being the only one left alive. The now godly Urza... Oh, right, sorry. Before the mending, planeswalkers were kind of OP, and wizards were not planning a patch of their powers anytime soon. So, as I was saying, the now godly Urza finally found out that the Phyrexians were behind most of his brother's madness, and so, being understandably a bit miffed by this, travelled to Phyrexia and sat down with Yogmoth and had a lovely chat with him over some tea. Nah, I'm just messing with you. He blasted a hole straight through four different spheres of the plane. Yeah, like I said, OP. Not too happy with his plane's impromptu four spheres deep excavation site, Yorgmoth set about corrupting and harassing the mind of the newly found planeswalker. Because, whilst Urza was OP, he was still on Phyrexia, where Yorgmoth, once again, is a literal god. Urza, really not being a fan of this, decided to leave the plane very quickly, and run across the multiverse, with the Phyrexians hot on his tail. Urza was eventually healed by another planeswalker, Sarah. Yeah, that one. But in doing so, he did lead the Phyrexians to her plane, where they corrupted and um, destroyed a huge portion of it. No good deed goes unpunished and all that. But Urza, now fully healed, returned to Dominaria and set about preparing to fight the Phyrexians, training mages in the Talarian Academy and gathering powerful artifacts fight the ensuing scourge. Yorgmoth had a similar idea. And by similar, I mean he created an entirely artificial plane, named it Wrath, and used it as a staging ground for all of his Phyrexian forces to grow, to the point where it would become so large that it would bleed into Dominaria, physically crashing into the other plane. Kind of seems like Urza's is bringing a knife to a gunfight, but we'll see how that goes. During the preparation time, Yorgmoth sent his only begotten son, Kirik, down to Dominaria to try and mess up the Talaran Academy, which, to his credit, he did successfully destroying the Academy. Urza, however, is nothing if not a massive cheat, so called a do-over and sent Khan, his silver golem, back in time to stop Kirik, which again, succeeded. This did, however, have the terrible side effect of causing the Academy's time to become... Oh, the technical term would be something like a bit of a state. Hours passed in the hallways in mere seconds, and lecture theatres had decades crawl by. Yeah, I remember something like that. But with the help of the wildness spirit Multani, Urza was finally able to defeat Kirik himself, killing Yorgmoth's son. But he couldn't celebrate his victory for too long, because it was not shortly after this that Wrath started bleeding into Dominaria, with the Phyrexian forces beginning their invasion. Massive portal ships appeared in the skies over Benelia, and Phyrexian forces pillaging and destroying the lands of Dominaria, even managing to take control of places like Yamamaya and Urborg. But this is where we get introduced to our real heroes of the story. Urza? No, not, not you. Really not you. Thank you. 
the crew of the Weatherlight joined the fight. Sisse, Gerard, Joira, Squee, Khan, and some other people who I really can't remember all met the Phyrexians in the skies, one ship against many, and did an admirable job. Urza, for his part, assembled nine powerful planeswalkers to go and attack Phyrexia directly. He gifted each of them a piece of power armour and set about leading the forces to Phyrexia. Among the nine titans was also Freilis and Lord Wingrace himself. In fact, all seemed to be going rather well until a planeswalker by the name of Tevash Sezat of the Nine Titans betrayed the rest, killing another member and planeswalker. Yeah, piece of advice. If your companion looks like this and is openly hostile towards everything you're doing, maybe don't invite them on a massively important mission. However, another point to add to the long list of reasons why Urza is not the hero of this story, he had in fact planned for this. Yes, indeed, Urza himself had invited Tivash along the mission, knowing he would betray them, so that he would have the sliver of moral high ground to activate the bomb that he had placed inside the power armour. A bomb that would use the very soul of its wearer to destroy a huge area of Phyrexia. Why are you like this? Oh yeah. Fair enough. Moving on. Whilst all of this was happening, back on the skies of Dominaria, Gerard's wife on the Weatherlight is killed by the ensuing Phyrexian forces. Bit of a bummer, really. And so Gerard travels to Phyrexia, meets up with Urza, and both go to confront Yorgmoth together. Now imagine this is the part where you think our two heroes will team up and go take down the big bad with the power of friendship and righteousness. the fact that Urza is still not a good guy, he had in fact developed a little bit of a crush on the Phyrexians, and realistically just wanted Yorgmoth Senpai to notice him. And Gerard, being a squishy human, just wanted his wife back. So when both were brought before Yorgmoth, he decreed that they should fight to the death. If Gerard wins, Yorgmoth will bring his wife back, and if Urza wins, Yorgmoth will give him all the secrets to technology that he wants. But to make this fight even remotely fair, Yorgmoth takes away all of Urza's Planeswalker's powers. So we now have a fight between a battle-hardened captain of a ship and an old dude in power armour. Yeah, you can imagine how this went. So Gerard actually ends up beheading Urza in the Phyrexian arena. And now, with no one to stop him, Yorgmoth descends on Dominaria himself as a dark cloud of death and destruction. Gerard, understandably being a bit miffed, goes back to Dominaria to try and stop its destruction whilst holding the head of Urza. After making his way back onto the Weatherlight with the head of Urza, Gerard is rejoined by his crew and Khan. It's as these heroes look on the destruction that Yorgmoth is wreaking on the plain that the head of Urza speaks. Like I said, kind of OP. Urza at 100% power, Urza at 99% power. Not really an issue for him. Urza informs the group that in fact they have all the tools to hand to defeat Yorgmoth right with them. Through his journey throughout the multiverse, Urza was in fact not just running. He was in fact collecting powerful artifacts to form something he called the Legacy Weapon. The final pieces of this weapon were in fact the Power Stones residing in Urza's own head, Khan the Silver Golem, and Gerard's life. The three joined together with the artifacts of the Legacy and emitted a powerful blast right onto Yorgmoth. The blast devastated the Dark Cloud, destroying and killing the Phyrexian God, once and for all. This weapon's use also came at the cost of the life of both Gerard and Urza, with the latter's spark now inhabiting the Silver Golem Khan, transforming him into a Planeswalker. Upon seeing the death of their leader, the Phyrexians lost all will to fight, either retreating back through the portals 
all simply throwing down their arms on the ground. Peace once again returned to Dominaria. Later on in the story it is revealed that Phyrexia is now simply a shadow of its former self. All manner of governance has crumbled and is now just simply a barren wasteland. And that is the story of the rise and fall of the original Phyrexia, all wrapped up with a neat little bow. Evil rises and good triumphs. I mean, it's not like an entirely new race of Phyrexians is going to spring up on a completely different plane because a planeswalker takes Phyrexian oil to a metallic place, the perfect breeding ground for a new ultimate evil to spawn from. <laughs> That's not going to happen. I said that wouldn't happen, would it? Would it, Khan? Look me in the eyes, Khan! And that is the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching. We'll conclude the story of Phyrexia in part two, so make sure to watch out for that. In the meantime, make sure to do a couple things for us. Like this video, subscribe, and leave a comment below. We read every single one. If you really like the channel, you could consider becoming a patron of it yourself with access to fantastic rewards, or just follow us on Twitter, at 4Commander. Links to all are in the description. And as always, I've been Alex, and I will see you next time.